Welcome to the podcast on JasonSolomons.com. I'm delighted to be joined by filmmaker Louise Osmond, who's filmed Versus, the life and films of Ken Loach, is currently out in cinemas, chronicling the life and films of our Palm d'Or champion, Ken Loach. You must have felt slightly, I don't know, jumping for joy when it won the Palm d'Or, I, Daniel Blake. I'm embarrassed to say that I, Rebecca did give me a heads up that they'd been invited back on the Sunday because you get no notice and they were invited back. So I was sat in front of what I understood to be the live stream of the event. But sadly, it turned out what I was watching was the live stream of the arrivals on a loop. So it wasn't until I got a call from the editor, JB, to say, he's won! I'm like, well, the ceremony hasn't started. So. Oh, you got stuck on the thing, you know, you had to move the thing. I, I did it the same way. I watched it from back home and I was like, oh, no. And they were keep keeping the, the thing going. You had to switch to channel another stream. Totally. Xavier Dolan, definitely. I had seen him arrive twice, which was, had I thought about it, odd. But yes, I was just watching the arrivals on a loop. Who knew that there would be a channel just for arrivals at Cannes. Yeah, it's, like it's, it's very Cannes, I have to there. say. Yeah. But the, the, did you think at any point, oh, God, I better I have to readjust my film now? My film not, is not irrelevant because, actually, when I saw your film, it, it's very much a make, part of it is the making of I, Daniel Blake. So you don't really need to do much, I wouldn't have thought. No, I mean, we somebody did mention it. One of the execs actually mentioned it and said, oh, should we do that? And I thought about it, and then we were actually just literally putting this kind of final copy of the film to bed, and I was watching it with some young people from the facility house and said at the end, do you think we should do this? Should we put a caption saying, and the film went on to win the Palme d'Or? And their feeling was actually the ending as it is, where Ken gives a typical uh, Ken uh, statement to the world, was, was sort of more true to him, and actually it is probably true that Ken isn't one to kind of, he's quite modest, he's, he's not one to kind of brandish his awards. Mm. So we thought probably it was truer to him to stick to the original ending. And yet it seems to me that of all his films, that I, Daniel Blake, is the sort of film that really needs the Palm d'Or because I think it's one of his finest films. Uh, and when Ken is on fine form, I think he's, you know, unstoppable. And I think I don't know, is a real masterpiece uh, of this genre. And the fact that if Ken Loach weren't making this film, I don't know if anyone else would or could possibly make this film. So to have the crowning endorsement of the Palm d'Or, and it's not an establishment crowning endorsement. It's a, it's definitely there's a maverick spirit that runs through something like the, the Palm d'Or. It's not a BAFTA or an Oscar, which requires a political kind of lobbying. This this film, I think, can can do much more. Uh, I say damage much more could do a lot more powerful effects with with the palm door than it could without yeah it was so interesting because obviously we followed it from early when they were you know Paul and Cam were first um, talking about the script and through the filming and what you don't quite see when that's happening is what's in Ken's head for how this will fully come to be and Going to see it was so powerful. Even though I've been present in many of the scenes and thought I knew it, it was just, um, it has this unbelievable quiet power, which is quite cumulative in the film. There's no music in it, and it's just, it's like deeply human film. And I think, as you were saying, it's about you do feel <clears throat> there, but for the grace of God, you feel you are one step removed at any time from what the main character gets caught up in. Yeah, at the end of it, I felt I'd had a, a you know, What's it called? Sucker Punch. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, you just feel the silent cinema was, I saw it with a few people and it was absolutely silent yeah. at the end. I was I was floored as, as if, you know, to a blow to the solar plexus, heartbroken. I mean, I physically felt exhausted by it, I pummeled by it, but not in a manipulative way, in, in a in a very good way. And I do wonder, I mean, you've looked at the legacy of Ken and the, and his friends and his, the, the, the family and, and his legacy of films. As I say, if he weren't making I, Daniel Blake, would anyone else? It's an interesting question. And sometimes I think that it was interesting making the film that you felt, in a way, the British film industry almost defines itself by Ken, in the sense that people either want to make clear they are definitely not Ken, or that they sort of fall within the Ken school. But even then, sometimes people are nervous of appearing to be called Lochian, you know. So um, is there anyone doing quite what he's doing? It's hard to say, isn't it? There are people who make... Some you know incredibly powerful like Cleo Claire Bernard I guess and others but I think I suppose Andrea Arnold ha is influenced by him, uses his cameraman Robbie Ryan who who shot both American Honey and I Daniel Blake in Cannes this year yes although in a in a way I think Andrea's voice is so completely distinct as well on the world so in a way I think I think there's nobody who's quite delivering such sort of quietly political films, I would mm. say. It's, ha it's hard. You know, that people sort of said, oh, Daniel, Bla Daniel Blake, and sometimes they get this with Ken Loach, especially from 
film buffs, you know, that, that it's not, uh, the French people say to me, well, there's not enough cinema in it, you know, that some, sometimes Ken, Ken's film um, almost on the nose in their, in their, in their political, or then, you know, there, there isn't an amazing shot in there or a fade or all that. It's like, and I said, well, it's some, certainly something like I don't know, Blake, if you've got something to say as powerful as this, don't muck it up with flashy photography. No, I mean, that, that was a, in a way to me, the, the power of it is absolute bare bones there's sort of no showmanship there's nothing to take your eye away so you you can't look away and mm. i think that's the power of it and the cumulative power of it is you just go deeper and deeper and deeper into this man's plight as he does and you're just absolutely with him and you know and that's you know and dave johns is a comic you know he's not an actor and yet you're kind of with him and hayley squires brilliant um performance by her you know she's so yeah it's and, uh, you know, honestly, it was, it was almost... We went to see it before our film had been finished and the editor and I were walking back and compared to that film, our, our film felt like this sort of go-go dancing with boas and dancing girls in feathers. There's lots of music in, lots of this and that. And we were like, oh, do you think we should sort of, like, tone it down a bit? <laughs> but... Uh, I think, I, if I may say, I think that makes a really good companion. Yours is an enjoyable film about a man who, who makes films that the mean stuff and i think you're, you didn't get in the way of, of it like that i think we, we've got some great insights into the man as well his films obviously show a part of this real ken loach uh, how much were you surprised by the difference between the private life of ken loach the ken loach you came to know through friends and through interviewing him and the work that he's put up on the screen is there much of a difference between them actually i in many ways i do think he actually kind of embodies his work that he is you know he is he is quiet and self-contained but um you know the smallest thing uh challenge a headline on a newspaper hearing something on a radio somebody says something and you just see these lights flick on inside and he's ready for war <laughs> you know so he is he is battle ready and pugnacious in the best you know it's great it's it's a lot of fun to watch you see him at a Q&A if somebody asks a provocative question he's just lights up i mean i think a lot of you know i do feel a part of that is also just he loves them you know he has something he believes in and he loves the fight he loves taking it out to anyone who's <laughs> ready to do combat which is you know age 79 that fantastic and i'm sure there's so many more films in him i'm sure it's absolute rubbish that he's going to retire because We've, i mean you, your your film has a sort of retirement na narrative that like he went out of retirement and then the tories came back to power and he felt i've just got to get out of my 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 chair and and, and fight the power again that was just to give us a poignant storyline. Yeah. I don't believe it for a second. I think he'll be out there making films at 89. It'll be fifth Palm Door. It'll be a kind of glorious career rolling on. Um, he's a, uh, there's a well-oiled machine now, I, I think, behind Ken with Rebecca O'Brien at 16 Films and Paul Laverty as a writer as well, which sort of I think takes some of the strain away. But when you've been a filmmaker, and it's interesting, in your film someone sort of says, you know, there's a sort of... Uh, uh, I suppose di dictator type dictatorial kind of filmmaker world that you enter. You know, people do things and create worlds for you, and you become quite sort of uh, monarchistic, odd oddly on set. Do you think he's managed to do that over fifty years as a filmmaker, and, and yet kind of comp comp compartmentalise his family life and his private life? You know, he's he's not like that. When you meet him, he's not like this dictatorial fellow. What, is he different on set? How how is he on set? Well, I think the thing that strikes you most I guess is what he's found a team he loves working with and it's such a lovely you know many of the people he's working with he's worked with for I mean decades like Rebecca's 30 years Paul I think is 20 Ray Beckett they've been doing films together since it was black and white he's you editor know, Jonathan Morris I think has done the last 15 as well absolutely so there's a really 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 close-knit team and the relationship between him and Rebecca as producer and Paul as writer is just so close. They just sort of, I think, just understand each other so well. And, you know, if an idea comes up, they're all able to think about its possibilities. And you think, how lucky. I mean, that's... But, but, but Ken has sought to make that happen and to create a world. So when he goes to work, he's working amongst people he absolutely trusts and enjoys the company of. So although he does compartmentalise his family life, and quite rightly so, I'm sure, his work life is not... Uh, Grim. It, it, it's it's exciting and among friends and mm. and a very kind of well-oiled machine. What did you um, when you were doing it 
uh, a film like this and you, you obviously went back and saw all of Ken's films back from up up the junction and Kathy Come Home and Poor Cow all, all the way up to the you know the, the, the one that maybe you watched Hidden, Hidden Agenda again and My Name is Joe again did you watch them all again did you did some things that you'd forgotten come up were there ones you hadn't seen which ones suddenly deserve re reappraisal I did I did watch them all it was it was funny because when we first started making the film I think Ken was quite ambivalent basically I think Rebecca had said to him let's do this Ken and he was like really are you sure uh so I kind of kept my distance from him for a while which gave me watching time so I did go away and watch everything and uh yes I think the kind of breadth and range it was so interesting to see to see the way his style developed through the early films and really kind of probably finding its uh, that style, style sort of settled in cares and then watching the films develop later I love the trilogy of Riff Raff Running Sands and Lady Bird and I guess I guess Paul's kind of beautiful films of Sweet Sixteen and My Name is Joe t totally ball rewatching. you know just loved going back to those films the kind of special Paul has a really distinct voice I think mm. yeah, I, was, I always wondered what Paul would do if he wasn't with Ken You'd love you to imagine that his crew would go out and sort of start making Michael Bay films or something, but I suspect <laughs> they won't. <laughs> it's interesting to me because you made the, the documentary Dark Horse um, recently about the, the the working men's club in a way that kind of club together and make this this dark horse kind of, you know, charge to victory. Uh, very inspirational. In a way, and not to damn you with the, 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 the adjective that you yourself use earlier, it, it has a Lochian element to it. Well, it, it was interesting that... Um, I suppose that's the thing. You can never make any kind of imitation of any kind of Ken Loach film because otherwise it would just be a terribly kind of pale imitation of a Ken Loach film. But it was, I suppose, I love those films. I say the, that kind of trilogy of Riff Raff Running Stones where there are kind of layers in the story. There's a lot of humour. There's a lot to kind of follow and be inspired by. But actually underneath there are some quite kind of serious issues. So in that sense, I I really loved making Dark Horse for the fact that Jan's journey seemed such a kind of lovely kind of up yours <laughs> to so many people and so many kind of forces at work that to bring down that valley or to bring down people within it uh so i love making that film i made it with a producer judith dawson we had a blast we had an absolute ball and it just came out in the states and jan and brian went out to the states and they just stormed it the americans completely got the story and sort of got them and what they were doing so they were like swarming it up in Manhattan and it was fantastic. Well, I always said uh, that the film sort of is crying out for a, a, a remake, a sort of real life, it can be an Ealing comedy, if you like, or a Ken Loach film, it's like the navigators kind of going up the tracks with these, these people kind of, kind of storming the paddocks at posh racing dues. Um, is, is that happening? I only mentioned that because your other documentary that I love of yours is Deep Water, the Donald Crowhurst story, which is now getting a, a, a feature film remake with um, Colin Firth as BBC Films. So I wondered, how did that happen to you? And is, is can that happen to Dark Horse? Is that what happens with your stories? They become so, you know, so real that they, they, they feel they need a fictional retreatment. Well, I think I think sometimes it's just that they're magical stories. I mean, I have nothing to do with the feature of, of Deep Water, but I, do, I heard that it was being done and, and think that um, Colin Firth is great casting and James Marsh, I think, is just a fantastic director. So I'll be there on day one just because I can't wait to see what he's done with it. And I think it'll be it'll be special, I think, in his hands because it's such a kind of poignant story and such a, a beautiful story, I think. Um, Dark Horse is, in fact, I'm probably not allowed to say too much, but it is being made as a, as a feature. Um, so we have had much delight teasing Jan and Brian about who should play them. Brian is mainly concerned that whoever plays him will have an appropriately narrow waistline because <laughs> Brian is built like a brick shit house, if you remember. And uh, but he also thinks that it, it that the actor should have his front teeth removed for the sake of realism. <laughs> so anyway, we've had a lot of fun teasing about it. Mm. But uh, but yes, that is in that is in the works. And are you involved in those works? Uh, only cheering on from the sidelines. Oh, OK. You wouldn't fancy doing it yourself. I mean, you haven't known the story so well and, and created the story out of the, the raw materials of the facts that you found. You know, I don't have thought you'd have been best qualified. I think I we had such a great time on our journey. I wouldn't want to kind of go back and mess with that. It was brilliant. And I think, you know, I'm sure they'll get someone who will be great to do it. And there's a lovely writer working on it. I probably better not say his name, but he's fantastic and he'll do a beautiful is job. Is it British? Is it American? British. British, good. You know what the hardest thing is going to be? Finding the horse. Yeah, 
too true. Honestly, we had him. He could play himself, but he's going to be getting on a bit. He's going to be approaching, you know, what do you call it? Pensioner age for a racehorse by then. So, yes, yes, I don't envy them filming the race sequences. No, I think, I no, that's going to be really, really tough. Oh, and, and, yeah. and, 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 you know, the guy that's going to play the back end, you know, I always feel terribly sorry for those people. No, exactly. I remember watching, I watched so many race films, horse race films before that, uh, just to sort of, you know, try and get to grips with how to film it. I remember watching things like Sea Biscuit and thinking, how are we going to stage <laughs> these races? So in the end, we used just a mix of different means and cheats and tricks mm. and some archive. But for the future, I guess they're going to have to do that themselves. Anyway, best of luck. <laughs> <laughs> Louise Osmond, best of luck with, with Deep Water, uh, which hopefully will rekindle interest in your documentary, uh, Dark Horse as well, lightly, but mostly with the Versus the Life of Films of Ken Loach, which is out in the UK cinemas now. And congratulations for hitching yourself to a winning horse in Ken Loach. <laughs> Thank you, yes, I feel a bit cheeky on his coattails.